Hello everybody. Over the last few days I have been lucky enough to enjoy the wonderful company of the stunning Ferrari 296 GTB, the first in a new line of V6 hybrid cars from Marinello and one which has generally impressed just about everybody who's driven it. As the car is about to go away in a couple of hours, I thought this would be the perfect time to do a little bit of a summary review and talk about all the things I've noticed through the week, both big and small, that may or may not be of importance to you if you are actually considering dropping, are you ready for it, near £400,000 on one of these cars. So enjoy a little drive of a morning in the Ferrari. 296. what you're interested in is how fast the car goes and what it sounds like when it's at full chat, well, let me give you a little taster. If you really want to know more about that, I suggest you check out the video which is officially part one of this, my main driving review in which I'll talk you through all the tech specs of the car and what it's like out on the open road when it's not 10 degrees and damp. Now this particular example does have a few controversial options about it and I think that's the best place to start this particular video. First amongst which is the Assetto Fiorano pack. That is a new thing that Ferrari started doing with the SF90 but have now begun to roll out across other models including this. Essentially it seems to want to bridge the gap between their regular cars and the specials like the Speziale, the Pista, that kind of thing. It consists of fixed rate multimatic dampers which are not adaptive like you get in the regular car so you lose your bumpy road mode, you also lose the ability to have lift. The car is a little lighter, a little bit more aggressively aerodynamic and has a few subtle changes throughout. It also enables you to have this 14 and a half thousand pound stripe and the pack itself costs about 27 and a half grand which goes some way to explaining why this particular test car got from the 254,000 pound base price up to a real world cost of about 380. So while no this one isn't exactly 400,000 quid it's only a heritage paint color and a stereo away from being so. But the fact is that one of these cars, even specified far more modestly, is going to have a price tag that starts with a three. I did a quick bit of cigarette packet maths last night and I reckon my dream realistic spec 296 would cost about 310 to 320 thousand pounds, which is a lot of money. I did the same for a F8 and it worked out at about 260. Of course, in the last few years, all manufacturers have put their prices up, but with Ferrari, I think the big issue is just how expensive those options are, and perhaps more pressingly, and something I want to talk about, is just what exactly is on the options list. When you consider the fact that this is a car that costs, at its most basic, a quarter of a million pounds, there are a lot of things that should be standard which aren't. This being a UK specification car, things you do get as standard include the uh, wireless charging mat down here, the cup holder, the front parking sensors, rear parking sensors and, miraculously, Apple CarPlay, which used to be a two and a half thousand pound option. Note, you cannot get Android Auto full stop which for me, as an Android user, is particularly frustrating, particularly when they did actually introduce Android Auto support with the Portofino M. But now, they appear to have forgotten about it again. I know maybe you could make an excuse for a car like this being chiefly an occasions thing that, uh, you know, not everyone's going to be worried about Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but again, it's a quarter of a million quid. I think it should just be there.
And I'm not going to go through the entire options list now, but when you look at stuff like the surround view camera at over £3,000, and then see there are other cameras as well for driving assist systems that are even more money on top. Things like the leather headliner here is over a thousand, I think 1500 quid. You're like, just a black leather headliner. Alcantara carpets, which by the way, I think are a daft idea, thousands of pounds. It's, it's nutty absolutely nutty. Yes, it's a wonderful, beautiful car. Yes, some of these pieces, like this big carbon fibre bit here, are really, really nice. But the amount of money Ferrari want to charge for some of these parts is just extortionate. There is absolutely no justification for it whatsoever. And for me, as a road tester, it does make things particularly problematic because it means that where, say, ordinarily this car would be, oh, I don't know, £60,000 more than a McLaren Artura. When you start to compare the two press cars, the difference is even bigger. This at 360 grand officially, actually today would be 380 to spec. Well, it doesn't really even have any competition. Happily, in the way that it drives, I don't think it has all that much competition either. I have driven the Maserati MC20, not the Artura to compare, uh, and next to that, uh, the, the Ferrari is just in a different league. Even with its silly multi-matic dampers that really belong on a racetrack, this is still a better set-up road car than the Maserati. I do, though, have some gripes on that front, as I'm sure you'd expect. I'm currently in full electric mode, doing 28 mile an hour. It's quite noisy, isn't it? First off, we've got a lot of road noise coming through, either tyre roar or something else, I just don't know, but it's there all the time. Of course, most of the week I've been having fun, window down, making a bit of noise with the engine, and uh, that's great. But when you do then back off and want to just have a normal journey, it can be quite tiring, and that's a shame. I am now going to take the car out of its full electric mode, which you can get about, realistically, I think, 12 to 14 miles of range in, and uh, put it in what is called qualifying mode. In this car, you've got your traditional Ferrari Manatino over here on the right, and what they call the E-Manatino over here on the left, which is just four settings for the way that the hybrid and uh, regular combustion engine work together. So you've got your uh, full electric mode, you've got your hybrid mode where it will turn the engine off as and when, then performance mode, which kind of just keeps the battery where it is, and then qualify mode where it will work the battery pretty hard. Paradoxically, when you are in qualifying mode, not only will it drain the battery the most, but it will also provide a significant amount of refill. In fact, I would say that when it comes to recharging its own battery, the 296 has to be one of the most efficient cars I've ever driven. I've never known anything to put charge in as quickly as this does. And so there, I do have to give Ferrari some credit. The engine, by the way, does make an absolutely fabulous noise. I love it. It's devastatingly effective, not that I can really show you that uh, of a morning like this, but one thing has been bugging me the whole time that I've had this car, and that's what does it sound like? I mean, it sounds great, sounds really nice. Ferrari call it the Piccolo V12, which I'm sure you've seen in every single review, meaning the little V12, and uh, not quite a V12, but you know what? I think they can have that one, because it does make a lovely little song. And I've spent ages trying to work out what does that remind me of? What is that tune from? You know when you hear someone humming something and you go, oh, I, 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 I know that, it's, it, it's there, it's there, I know that. What is that from? And it was yesterday that I got it. That, that's a Nissan RB, isn't it? That's what this is. This sounds like an R34 Skyline V-Spec 2. Gran Turismo fan in me makes me a very, very happy boy. 
I'd probably get excommunicated from Ferrari by saying that, but <laughs> it's a good noise. I don't care what makes it. It's a lovely, lovely sound. I'm also impressed at just how much there is of it. I mean, considering this car has been made to the current modern rules, regs, and everything else, <laughs> it's great. And oh my, <laughs> it goes, it really goes. This car has performance all the time. You basically can't catch it out. I mean, the fact is, with 170 horsepower from the electric engine, actually, most of the time you could drive around with just that and the car would be perfectly fine. Add to it a 663 horsepower, three litre twin turbo, 120 degree V6, and you have something which is, uh, every bit as devastating as you might imagine. If uh, Car Wow or Matt Watson are, are watching, I would love to see a drag race between this and a LaFerrari. I don't even need to see the drag race between this and the Enzo because I know this with its more powerful engine, more torque, and uh, okay, yeah, a little bit more weight, but also much more modern gearbox would just trounce the Enzo. Over the week, I have also somewhat grown to admire the car's looks. It still has awkward angles. The rear, to me, is just still too fussy and apparently heavily inspired by the Honda Fireblade with all the, the little holes it's got in it. Ferrari seem to be becoming obsessed with that. The side profile, though, is stunning. The front view is gorgeous. And uh, in this particular spec, the car gets a loony amount of attention. I have never known a car be on my driveway and get so many comments from the other people in the village. It's hilarious. Now, I'm fairly confident that a large part of that is the colour scheme of the car, which is a throwback to the 1960s racing colours of Marinello Concessionaires, the official importer for Ferrari in the UK back in the day. When children see it, though, all they can see is Spider-Man. And uh, one child did walk past the car going, Spider-Rari, Spider-Rari, which uh, I suppose was inevitable. This being Italian, though, of course, they'd never call it Spider-Man colours. No, instead it'd have to be something, I suppose, like uh, Tributo Signori Arachnido, you know, something like that. I know when it comes to talking about Ferraris, particularly new and expensive ones, people will always talk about the possibility of negative feedback from Joe Public, especially here in the United Kingdom, which is filled with very, very bitter people when it comes to those that have nice things. This, though, Maybe because it appeals to kids quite so much. I've not had any of that. Not one single negative comment the entire time that I've had it. People love it. <laughs> and you know, to me, if a car like this can't make a child just burst out laughing and go, Mum, 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 look, then uh, what is the point? You know, really. I mentioned earlier the Assetto Fiorano pack that this car has, complete with its uh, fancy Multimatic race orientated suspension. And uh, yes, that does make the ride quite firm. Though, in all fairness, I don't think any firmer than an MC20, which has no excuse because that does have adaptive dampers. And I think it's still a hair more supple than a 992 GT3. If you think you could daily one of those, you could possibly daily one of these. The big difference really between the two being you can't have suspension lift with this. And when I spoke to my Ferrari dealer, they said that that on its own was one of the key reasons for about 60% of people not going with the Fiorano pack. This being a brand new Italian supercar filled with all sorts of fancy technology from hybrid systems to a brand new infotainment system that, okay, was introduced with the SF90, but in Ferrari terms is still very new. People, I think, are understandably very concerned about reliability. And I have to say, this was a problem when I had my last Ferrari press car, the Roma, because that, every single day that I drove it, gave me an error message, which I think likely related to potentially a bad battery. And it never really stopped me from being able to enjoy the car or drive it. But when you're talking about these kinds of money, or really, in the modern age, any kind of money for a new car, that's just not acceptable. I am, though, happy to report that in that regard, the 296 has been much better. The one and only error message that I've seen out of it all week was one for a failed brake light. And I did phone Ferrari about that to consult with them, and they said they hadn't seen that on the car before, and uh, I even checked the brake lights myself, and 
they all seem to be working just fine. So uh, not quite sure what was going on there. It hasn't appeared since and uh, neither happily have any other error messages. Now you'll note that I'm driving this car currently fairly gently. I've got it in wet mode. But even still, you can have a lot of fun and make very good progress when you consider it's an 830 horsepower car driving just the rear wheels. This is the majesty of Ferrari's electronics package. They make these cars, they make this amount of power so accessible. I'd, I'd be happy driving this car in essentially any conditions short of snow and ice. I think unlike the Roma, there's not really many chances of anybody actually wanting to use one of these as a daily driver, but if you did want to take it away on a long trip, which I think there are a lot of people that are going to do that, well, you've got a nice decent sized boot up the front which is just under 200 litres and has just about the right amount of space for two carry-on bags. In fact, my current camera bag is precisely sized to be an airline carry-on, a full-size BA one, you know, not the sort of thimble that rides and air let you have and it looks like you can get exactly two of those in the front so uh, don't worry if you don't fancy it you don't have to buy the official luggage for it I keep looking at the back because this car does have a spoiler that unlike the SF90 which drops down actually drops up very unusual for Ferrari having a spoiler of any description on the car. It's not quite as dramatic or as big as, say, the uh, air brake you get on many a McLaren, but in the entire week, I have only actually noticed it pop up once when I put my foot down quite hard. It's dictated by a whole bunch of things, including throttle input, speed, potentially even the Manatino setting, all sorts of stuff, and uh, yeah. As with other Ferraris, there is certainly no button for you to force it up or anything like that. They, uh, they don't like that sort of thing. The steering, I think I stick by my comments that I made in the driving video. It's nice, it's fast, it's got a little bit of weight into it, but it's lacking the texture and some of the feedback of the old hydraulic racks and is likely bested by just about any McLaren that I've ever driven and certainly any Lotus. This being said, it's still not anywhere near bad enough to get in the way of me enjoying this car. Just going back a few topics though to the subject of noise and I have noticed that throughout the week this car has made quite a few that I don't like so much as that of the engine. There is a weird mysterious rattle over there that often sounds like it's coming from the wing mirror but I don't think that it is, just a gentle, you know, that sort of thing. This you might be able to hear is just constantly creaking the whole time and I've checked, the seat isn't touching anything but uh, still just creaking constantly and that is uh that is irksome considering there's not actually really much leather in here for anything to be touching it's all carbon on carbon like that shouldn't rattle how have they managed that these lovely blue racing seats which you can have in other colors of course i actually quite like the padding is very very firm so be warned about that the four point racing harnesses i'm less a fan of because they're, they're very very fiddly trying to get things to actually click in is quite the chore. Also on the topic of noises, the bass stereo is really, really not very good at all. And that leads me on to what I consider to be one of the biggest failings in this car. The whole this bit. In theory, in practice, I don't think it's actually a terrible design, but Ferrari, it would appear, have made the same mistake as a great number of other manufacturers. They are not alone in this regard. Porsche, Lamborghini, Mercedes, so many others do exactly this. It feels like all of the infotainment system in this car, what Ferrari call the uh, human machine interface, you know, anything that you as a person, the squishy bit in the middle, have to touch. It feels like it was designed by an 18 year old who can't actually drive the car and has just sat in it, pressing everything, prodding stuff and going, yeah, that all works really nicely. But the problem is, there's a reason people don't like capacitive buttons in a car. First off, they're just really unintuitive. Like, uh, you've got the uh, wing mirror controls down here. What's wrong with just having a little deeper? That's all this really does. Nothing else fancy. I'm sure it's something else, but it's needless. Same for the uh, aircon control over here. All this little bit down here does is make the car cooler or warmer. There is a little hockey for it on the steering wheel that I do like. But why does that need to be a capacitive swipey thing? 
VW made this mistake and every single road tester disliked it and I'm pretty sure it's going to be the same for Ferrari. Just give us an actual slider or a dial because when you're on the move, especially in a car with a bouncy suspension like this, it's much, much easier to do. If I want to get the car a little bit cooler, I've got to look down there and try and get my finger in the right place and everything and it's just, ugh, it's just frustrating, it's just needless, it's a daft oversight. More frustratingly though, is the fact that all of the stuff up here feels like it's got a processor which is just not quite good enough for the task at hand. Everything is just a little bit laggy. It's better than the Roma for sure, but still not as good as it should be. It's just not that slick. <laughs> I do like this engine. And I also noticed the strangest of things that I haven't had in any other modern car. The other night I was out and about and I thought, you know what, let's listen to some music. Let's do a proper thorough review of this car. So I connected my Bluetooth to the car because without Android Auto, that's the best I can do. And I just put some music on. Now, this is a task that just about any modern car should be able to do without any issue. Play some tunes over Bluetooth. And the Ferrari got off to a reasonable start. Sound quality wasn't great, but it was going along nicely. And then it just started skipping and wouldn't stop. Every sort of 10 seconds, you know, I can't live, live, live with it. Okay, it didn't turn everyone into a pub singer, but <laughs> shooting stars fans there will appreciate that, I'm sure. And no. It felt like I was back in the bad old days when you had, you know, a Discman, but before they'd invented anti-skip technology. It, it, it's baffling. I've never known a car be that bad at just playing music. <laughs> and it's just those little details, those small little things that in a car at any price shouldn't happen now. And definitely, definitely in one that costs a quarter of a million pounds or as here 380 grand shouldn't shouldn't be an issue that's just that's just poor that's really really poor and the fact is that for me as ferrari attempts to sell even more cars which is going to mean selling them to people that aren't so willing to put up with ferrariness they really really need to sort this stuff out it's, it's a shame because I don't think it stopped me from buying a car like this, but I can tell you something, if I did buy one, and I'm sure this is probably just a random glitch, but if I did buy one, and it started doing that, it would be going back to the dealer to get fixed, and if they couldn't fix it, it's like, well what, you want me to keep a 300 plus thousand pound car that can't even play Bluetooth music? No, <laughs> not happening. I'm sure half the audience now is going, yeah, too right, you tell them. And the other half going, oh, well, clearly James owning a Ferrari is not for you, is it? Well, <laughs> au contraire. At least in the Scuderia, they, you know, there wasn't really any point with making the stereo decent, so it doesn't even have one. <laughs> this, I'm happy to say, does. And the spec of this car is quite interesting. I was talking to my buddy Ant the other day about it, who's driven it a little bit and has been very, very helpful with getting out of the drive-by and other shots that you've seen in all the videos. So a big thank you as ever to him. He loved it, by the way. I mean, you know, he is human. Oh, this is handy, Laurie. Yeah, this is how I get the press car written off. Let's just reverse, putting me into an unsighted bend. Yeah, nice. So Ant really, really enjoyed it. In fact, he says that he enjoyed it so much that this car, single-handedly, has kind of convinced him that he might want to buy a Ferrari and he's currently trying to work out what maybe that would be. Of course, he needs to test drive a few cars and maybe it won't happen, but it set him on a path of thinking, you know what, actually, if this is the sort of way that they are, hmm, the brand could be for me. And he raised a very, very valid point because we were talking about whether this would be worth the money. Okay, this being a press car, this being the way it is in terms of spec, you know, not everyone's going to have the car like this. And there are currently a whole bunch of 296s up for sale, most of which don't have the Fiorano pack, and they're about £260,000. And at £260,000, I can much easier make a recommendation for buying one of these. Uh, 260 grand, yeah, do it. 360, yeah. 
that would be more than the price of my F12 and Scuderia combined. And the Scud is still the more dramatic, more exciting, more engaging, more raw car because of what it is. And the F12 is the uh, classier, better continent cruiser and the uh, more luxurious place to be and the nicer place to spend a little bit more time because of what that is. This is still a remarkable achievement. And uh, I wouldn't swap either of those cars for one. However, I would, I would have one of these over an F8 even if for no other reason, and I think I prefer the sound in this. The point, though, that I'm trying to get to here is that when we were trying to work out, you know, the value of this car, Ant said that for something like this, with the way it's been specced, you could just buy a Pista. And on track, because it is noticeably lighter, the Pista probably is going to be the better car to own if you're the sort of person that tracks your 300 plus thousand pound Ferrari. And they do exist, I've seen them. And I seem to recall that you can actually get the Pista with front lift as well. And uh, I've got to say, the Pista is an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous car. And a lot of the specs for them were just sensational. There's some really nice blues they did, which are just, oh, oh, oh so good. I'm not actually sure what color I would have this in, an F8, for example, is easy. It's got to be yellow. But this, I, I don't know. I mean, I actually quite like the red. It does wear it very well. But because the looks of it, the curves on it, they're very unlike just about any other modern Ferrari. And I don't know. Maybe it'd suit a nice green. What would you go for? I might go for something a little bit unusual, like a heritage colour. I think it'd wear really, really well. It'd match the kind of, you know, retro 60s inspired looks. I also really don't like the fact that even the engine start-stop button is now a capacitive one. It's not even haptic. There's just no response to your input at all. And the engine start-stop on a car like this, Lamborghini have got it right, you know, put it under a big toggle so you feel like you're starting a fighter jet or something, you know, just, just give it a bit of drama. One thing I think I did also actually forget to mention in the uh, main review is that this car, like a lot of other Ferraris, you can drive it along with the window down and not really get much in the way of buffeting. The way they've done the aerodynamics, it works beautifully. <laughs> so weird to think that in a Ferrari. This car does make a lot of other weird noises. I went into it the other night and I just sort of turned it on. The engine wasn't even spinning or anything. And it sounded like a broken Dell laptop from about 15 years ago. Not quite sure what was going on. I mean, I, I was getting worried. It stopped eventually, but it, it didn't sound like a kind of noise it was meant to make. I've got to say, the hybrid system here does work really, really well. The interaction of the combustion and electric engines is superb. They've actually done a similar thing to what Porsche do with a lot of their e-hybrids. So at low RPM, you get a lot of assistance from the electric motor. Then in the middle of the rev range, it kind of goes away. Then at the top end, it comes back in. And that's what gives you that sort of real high-end surge. It means that you will take this car all the way to eight and a half thousand rpm and enjoy it and it is ultimately fundamentally and this is really i suppose in a lot of ways the only thing that matters a very very enjoyable car i mean i'm glad that this has actually been the only wet day that i've had it and even so you can still have a lot of fun i've got it in wet mode and you know it's there for a reason but I'm very, very grateful that I've had it in dry because it does need to be dry. The conditions do need to be right for you to be able to appreciate exactly what it can do. I can see why you could drive something like this for, you know, half an hour and go, yeah, no, no, it's really, really good. But, you know, a 488 is already really flipping fast. This just has a very different character about it. And yet still, it's recognizably Ferrari. Oh, actually, another bugbear, the passenger display over there, when you turn it off, the backlight stays on. So it's not really off. At night, that's very distracting. Don't like that. 
nor do I like the uh, Italian Tricolore down here. I mean, the gear selector, yeah, ergonomically, it's actually quite good. You can use it fairly easily, you know what's going on, you know where your hands are, but they're plasticky. It's the interaction, the feel of it. Considering this replaces the iconic gated shifter, a, a, an engineering masterpiece, an icon of design, it's just not quite good enough. Like, I'd like it if it slides or moved a little bit more. Just something, please, Ferrari. Come on, sort this bit out. You get so much of the rest of it right, it's just a few of the little details that need help. I think it likely has been maybe a little bit better on fuel than some of the other cars that I've had from the company, but unfortunately, as with all other Ferraris, they don't give you an economy gauge, so I couldn't really tell you, nor have I done enough miles or in any kind of regular driving to actually work out a fuel economy figure that would be meaningful. I know, I know, nobody buying this sort of car really cares, but one issue potentially that I have with this car is that, likely because of the hybrid stuff, they've shrunk the fuel tank. To give you some context, in my 430, it's 95 litres. Here, 65. And I suspect, if you're on a bit of a trip out, having a little bit of fun, that could become an issue. Especially if you were to, say, go somewhere like the Highlands of Scotland, where super unleaded can be a little bit hard to find. Um, might be a concern. I've not actually plugged the car in at all this week, but it's a, a relatively small battery pack, so if you didn't want to overnight, you could plug it in and, you know, easily, easily get a full charge, probably do so in a couple of hours or so. I am going to miss this car. And I was saying to Anthony, you know, right now, it's just, it's not the right time for me to have one. It's, it's just not. It, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe I could afford one, but it would involve selling basically all of the other Ferraris, and to me, no, uh, there's a reason I've got the ones that I have. I'm very lucky in that way. And, and yeah, yeah, one day I'd love to spec a car from new, but I want to do it properly. Perhaps in a couple of years, if these are still available to order, if things have got any better for me or something's happened and I've got a little bit more money to hand, I'd like to do it, but I probably missed the boat on this one. And that's a shame because actually, I would have one. I really would. Anyway. I hope you've enjoyed the uh, couple of videos that I made on this car, and if you've enjoyed looking at it, don't worry, there is actually one more soon to come, a little bonus that I decided to record with this as a backdrop that I wasn't originally intending to do so, but figured, hey, why not? When life gives you a Ferrari 296 GTB, you take it out every opportunity you can get. And so, I want to say a big thank you to Ferrari for letting me have their car for a week, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye. Annoying, like, there. I get them in now. I don't like them. They didn't need to change anything. They were fine before.